Uh, so this will be the last regular seminar, but uh, we will have next week we will have a special seminar uh, with uh, like four lightning talks. So uh, PhD students in our field uh, will uh, present their uh, research. So uh, Hong Sok is an uh, assistant professor uh, at DRO uh, in DRO at uh, Columbia Business School and a member of uh, Columbia Data Science Institute. And before joining Columbia, he, he, he received a PhD from uh, Stanford University, and uh, he was also a research scientist at uh, Facebook Core Data Science. Uh, he, uh, he, he's also uh, currently also a LinkedIn scholar uh, in LinkedIn's uh, responsible AI team. And uh, Hong's uh, research interests lie in the uh, interface of machine learning, OR, and causal inference, and particular in emphasis uh, on uh, developing reliable uh, learning methods for decision-making problems. Uh, Hong's research has been uh, recognized by several awards, including uh, paper awards at URIPS, uh, ICML, and uh, INFORM's Applied Probability Society and conference on uh, computer vision and pattern recognition. Uh, so today, uh, Hong will uh, discuss uh, adaptive experimentation at scale. Hong, uh, Thanks, floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation to speak here. And thanks to the rest of the organization, uh, organizers as well. It's nice to see some uh, familiar faces in the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a recent work of mine that uh, I'm quite excited about because it poses a new perspective to a, a rather classical problem of adaptive experimentation. By the way, I guess it's a fairly small group we have here today. So feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. It'd be great to keep this casual and interactive. Uh, I guess also it's uh, one of the ways to make uh, online seminars more enjoyable for everyone, I guess, is to uh, keep things as interactive as possible. So if you have any, I don't know, life stories or jokes you want to uh, tell in between the talk, uh, please let me know. Okay, um, I have a question. If, do people see my pointer on the slide? Good, okay. Great. So everything I'm going to talk about today um, is work done by my PhD student, Ethan Chait. He's fabulous and is actually going to be applying for jobs next year. So uh, keep uh, an eye out for him. Okay, so to set up the talk, let me start with a motivating example. So let's imagine that you're a AI engineer working for one of these large online platforms, and you've been tasked with uh, building the platform's next generation recommendation system. Okay, so you could be recommending products on Amazon, right? Uh, videos on Netflix or YouTube. Uh, here are a people recommendation system from a social network, right? Uh, and you can kind of see that the social network, it's a professional network run by LinkedIn. You can see that it, the product actually works quite well. It's recommending me my colleagues from Columbia UR. Okay. Now, if you're this AI engineer who's been tasked with building this recommendation system, right? Uh, there's a few different ways to go about doing this, but they effectively all follow the same process. Okay. So first, you're going to sit down and think about what is the data set that you can train ML models on, right? And you're going to look for labels that are cheap and abundant, okay? So for example, if you show me uh, Henry's profile on, on uh, social media, right? Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, right? Am I going to click on Henry's profile, right? Am I going to click on this, uh, on this uh, button? Okay. Now, if I click on him, am I going to send him a friend invitation? If I send him a friend invitation, is he going to accept this, this invitation? Right? And if you become friends, right? if you become connected in this network, are we actually going to start talking to each other and have meaningful social interactions? For example, am I going to continue to comment on his posts and so on? Right? So there's a bunch of these different short-term outcomes that are abundant, yet somewhat frivolous. Okay. And uh, for the ML folks in the room, you can train an ML model for to predict each and every one of these outcomes, combine these scores, right? And then rank everyone based on these scores, and you can maybe show me the top ones, right? Or uh, you can also predict all of these outcomes using a single model. This is called multitask learning. Okay. And then you can use these scores again to rank people. 
So a bunch of different ML methods that you can think about uh, for doing this. But basically, at the end of the day, you're going to be predicting these short-term outcomes that are abundant, right, and, and are cheap to get. Now, this is the AI perspective. If you take a step back, and if you now take the perspective of uh, a product manager or a uh, uh, an executive running this product, then you don't actually care that much about the extent to which you can predict these short-term outcomes, right? What you do care about is whether this recommendation system is able to meaningfully contribute to the user experience on the social network, right? Is it actually able to onboard new users to the platform and help them grow their professional network, for example? Mm -hmm. And the, the interface between these short-term outcomes, this, these things that you can actually build prediction models for, and these long-term metrics that you're actually interested in, right? This interface is usually the A-B testing. Okay, so you come up with a bunch of these different treatment arms, these different configurations of the recommendation system. Here are the blue arm, the pink arm, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to flip a, a multi-sided coin, right, to, to uh, assign any one of these recommendation systems to each user. And this is how I'm going to figure out whether my recommendation system is actually able to contribute to the user experience. So far, very standard stuff. Now, in this setting, even in an online platform where, where you have hundreds of millions of users at your disposal, right? Uh, the main challenge is actually that no matter how good an ML engineer you are, right? No matter how good you are at AI, you're actually only going to contribute to the, to the user experience by something like 2%, right? And 2% of total watch time at Netflix, that's still like humongous business, uh, business impact, right? But statistically, this is a very difficult problem. It's an underpowered problem. Samples are actually quite expensive, okay? So of course, uh, experimentation uh, more broadly outside of this online platform setting, it's, uh, it's the foundation for scientific decision-making, right? It's used in, in medicine, healthcare, uh, to set different economic policies, to evaluate product and engineering innovations alike. And if samples, right, if statistical power is this important to concern in these online platforms where samples are supposed to be abundant, Right. If you're a social scientist running an experiment, say, in some village in, in, in Indonesia, try to figure out which microfinancing strategy is useful, right, then samples are going to be a lot more expensive right, than in these online platform scenarios. So statistical power is really a fundamental concern. And as most of you probably know, right, uh, there has been a very large body of work that uh, really tries to address the statistical power problem by thinking about how to reallocate measurement effort right, across time. Okay? So these usually go by the name of multi-arm bandits. And culturally speaking, right, the, the main research methodology that we use to develop these adaptive algorithms is using theory, right, using regret bounds. Okay? So these papers, they usually assume that uh, that each time a user arrives to the platform, right, Chang'an might come in and I see what Chang'an uh, liked and didn't like, and then I use it to decide what I'm gonna do to Shane who arrives next, and then to Sandeep, and then to Sidleen, and so on and so forth, right? And as I do this infinitely many times, I look at different types of performance guarantees. Usually you try to show regret bounds, okay? Now, if you have uh, slight changes in the goal, for example, you might care about cumulative regret, Right, whether or not you disadvantage users across the experiment versus the best option that you pick at the end of the experiment, which is usually what we call terminal regret or simple regret. Right? If you have any combination in between, then you have to write a, basically a new paper showing a different type of uh, uh, regret down. Okay. And of course, this theoretical paradigm, it actually makes it quite difficult to model the key operational constraints that we have in practice. So just to give you a sense of what these look like, right? The main operating constraint, the binding constraint, is that reallocating measurement effort is actually quite challenging. It's costly. And this is the case even in online platforms where everything is supposed to be automated. Right? So we have uh, all types of delayed feedback, meaning whether uh, to figure out whether this recommendation system is helping Shane grow his uh, professional network. Right? I actually have to wait a while. In addition to this, there's practical difficulties of me trying to ramp up a particular experimental design, right? So the reality of these online platforms is that you have literally milliseconds to load recommendations. 
Anything beyond that, users are going to start to stop using your product. Right? So latency is a really key concern. And in a typical uh, A-B test, right? let's say that you have eight different configurations of the recommendation uh, system that you want to test, eight different treatment arms. And let's say that these green bars is the proportion of times you want to assign each arm. Right? The way to, to make this fast, to address latency concerns, is to essentially, uh, prior to deploying your product, basically, you decide which user is going to use which recommendation system. So you build up a hash map, and you save all of these things, and that's how you're able to serve these recommendations the moment Chang'an logs into my app. Right? So it's a fairly complicated process. Right? So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that even in an automated system, reallocating measurement effort is actually quite challenging. So again, if you're the social scientist in Indonesia trying to manually uh, change your allocation, it's all going to be quite painful. Okay? So as a result, in practice, no one really uses adaptive experiments all that much. In my experience in, in, uh, in, in the tech world, 99.9% .9 of all experiments are static A-B tests, right? And at most, you're going to be able to reallocate your, your uh, measurement effort a few times. Right? So we're going to have very, very large batches. Okay. So today, I'm going to talk about a, a new paradigm of algorithmic development. We are really going to focus on the constants of the problem. Meaning, what happens if you are only able to change your experimental design, right, your allocation, five times, not infinity, right? So then it's not about these big O notations that we usually use to characterize your gear crowd, square root of T log T, and so on, right? T is literally equal to five. It's all about the constants, the instance specific signal to noise ratio, okay? And if you write down a particular optimization problem, really geared geared towards these problem specific uh, constants, right? I'm going to now put on this mathematical programming hat, and I'm going to go, how do I use modern computational tools, namely ML and optimization, right, to solve this dynamic optimization problem, to solve this dynamic program? Okay. And this mathematical programming view is going to allow us to handle multiple objectives, right, different variations to, uh, as to what you'd want in this adaptive experiment in a very flexible way. So we're basically going to put on our ML hats and try to uh, think about how can we use PyTorch to come up with a reasonable adaptive experiment? And a key practical desiderata in what I'm going to talk about today is going to be that any algorithm we develop, it must handle batches in a very flexible way. Meaning, I don't actually know how many people are going to use my product on any given day of the experiment. Right? So if I need to resolve for some allocation each time the number of people who use my product changes, right, it's not going to be very practical. Okay. Now, for the for the experts in the room, uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, uh, particular strand of the bandit literature called batch bandits. And these set of uh, works, they essentially take the standard theoretical tools that we use to prove various performance guarantees, right, in the fully adaptive regime, and then you try to make it less adaptive. Okay. The big difference between our work and and, and this literature is going to be that we're going to actually start with A B tests static experiments, and then we're going to make them slightly more adaptive, right? Five allocation opportunities. T is literally equal to five. So the regret bounds are really not going to kick in. Okay. And contrary to the conventional wisdom that batching is this additional desiderata that you need to consider, right, to, to modify your proof techniques and so on, we're actually going to show that batching significantly simplifies algorithmic design. And the main idea of this paper is actually very, very simple. It's that normal approximations, CLTs, which are universal in statistical inference, right? We use p-values all the time. It's actually quite useful to design adaptive experiments as well. What do I mean by that? Okay. Well, think about what you're going to do to calculate these p-values in a typical experiment. You're just mostly going to take the sample mean, right? Of all the people who got a particular treatment option, say the blue treatment arm, this particular recommendation system, and then we're going to see, right, use a normal approximation to approximate the distribution of the single number, the sample mean, and we're going to use uh, some threshold to decide whether I can reject the null or not, right? So basically, I'm just taking the sample mean in any given batch, right, for any R, and I'm going to approximate the distribution of the sample mean using a Gaussian, okay? And in this view, if I assign the blue treatment arm quite a bit on this day of the experiment, 
right? So the bar at the top here is just the proportion of times I assign the blue treatment arm, right? So if I gave the blue treatment arm a lot, then I'm going to have a skinny, tall Gaussian, right? Because I have a lot of samples. And the pink treatment arm, which I did happen to not have assigned as much, is going to be flatter. It's going to be more dispersed. Okay. So now if I take this view, I can actually formulate a dynamic program, a sequential optimization problem, where each batch, each day of the experiment, gives me a set of Gaussian observations. And the, dis the dispersion of these Gaussian observations, right, is modulated by the proportion of times you pull each other. Okay. And then based on the Gaussian observations on the first day of the experiment, you decide what you're going to do in the next batch, in the next day. Right? And you do this five times or three times in this picture. So using this view, using the central limit approximations, I'm actually going to be able to write down a very concrete optimization into PyTorch and then put on my ML hat and go, how do I computationally solve or approximately solve this dynamic program? So if you take away one thing in this talk, it's actually this picture. So let me pause here in case there's any questions. Everyone doing okay? I'm going to take the silence as a yes, but please feel free to stop me anytime. Okay. So now let's talk about how we're going to formalize uh, this intuition. And basically, our goal is to really model these practical instances, right, where the signal to noise ratio is extremely small, right? Power is a, is a fundamental concern. Okay. And the way we're going to do this is by taking this classical perspective that statisticians have. Uh, thought of uh, for multiple decades. So uh, if you want to formalize notions of statistical power in binary hypothesis testing, right, you typically think about the null and the hypothesis and uh, say that under the null, you're going to have this confidence interval that's going to shrink at the one over square root of n rate by the central limit theorem. Right? So then as n grows, your confidence interval is not going to include the alternative. So we're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis. Right. So under this view, right, power is not a consideration as n grows. So the only interesting regime in which you can quantify notions of statistical power is when the alternative is one over square root of n away from the null itself. Right. So you think about the null and the alternative being one over square root of n away. This is the only admissible, the only interesting regime. So we're going to take adopt this viewpoint, right? So we're going to model these underpowered underpowered experiments by considering average rewards that scale as one over square root of n, where n is the number of people that use my product on any given day of the experiment. It's my batch size. Okay. For now, I'm just going to, uh, for simplicity alone, I'm just going to assume that uh, the same number of people use my product on any given day of the experiment. That doesn't have to be the case. Okay. So each reward that I see, right, meaning uh, how much uh, did Shane's professional network grow, that's basically capital R here, right? is going to scale as 1 over square root of n. The mean is going to scale as 1 over square root of n plus some uh, idiosyncratic noise. Okay. Now imagine that the average uh, treatment effects, the average rewards, were of a larger magnitude. Right? Then you don't need any adaptivity because all of your confidence are will shrink at 1 over square root of n. Okay. So we're in a trivial regime. Now, if the uh, average rewards were smaller than this, then no matter the amount of adaptivity you have, right, you're dead. Inference is actually not possible at all. So in some sense, this is the bright scaling. And of course, uh, for anyone who's seen a, a diffusion limit for uh, queuing systems, right, this is the familiar diffusion scaling. Okay. So under the scaling, if I take the sample mean of the people who got uh, uh, arm A or any given day of the experiment, right, then by the CLT, I can write down the sample mean, right, as approximately normal. And the sample uh, and the population mean of this normal distribution is going to have this population average reward term H in it. Okay, and this is the key quantity that I now want to figure out, right? I want to figure out which one of these recommendation systems have the highest H, and this is what I want to pick. Okay. 
So here is the same equation again, right? I'm connecting this back to my, my diagram before. Again, each day of the experiment for each R, I get a normal observation. And each observation gives me some information as to what the average rewards H looks like. And the proportion of times I pull each R, right, is going to control my effective sample size. Okay. That's why I had a skinny tall Gaussian for the blue R and the dispersed pink uh, Gaussian curve, right, for the other R. All right, now I'm going to talk about uh, math and how we're going to formalize all of this. So let me pause here again in case there's any questions. At this point, the conceptual aspects of things should be clear. Yeah, Shane, thanks. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, Hong. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the chance to jump in here. Um, I'm just thinking about the scaling, and I completely buy your perspective that you have these three different kind of classifications. What I guess what I'm wondering is, um, from a slightly different perspective, with the ends that are of the scale that you're looking at, are admissible um, uh, sort of sub suboptimal arms or whatever, are they are they interesting? Because if n is on the order of n to the six, do I care? Good, good. That's an uh, excellent question. So Shane's question is basically, if I have access to, say, 100 million users right, uh, on any given social network, is it actually meaningful to, to consider adaptivity as a research question, meaning do you need adaptivity at all? And uh, the answer is, unfortunately, yes, because all of these products actually have a fairly small treatment effect. And to tease them out, right, you actually need this large a, a sample size. So power is actually a key concern in all of these online platforms, right, uh, really because the treatment effects at their largest are going to be something like 3%. Typically, the lifts that you expect are less than 1%. And this is why uh, a lot of these uh, online platforms have invested so much on their experimentation infra. So, uh, and of course, uh, in certain cases, you might have a treatment that's so awesome that, that you don't need any adaptivity at all. Um, but the problem is that we're rarely in this regime. So that's a great question. Any other questions? Good. Um, and, and, and maybe a, as an additional uh, answer to that uh, point, even when n is very small, something like 10, uh, 1,000 or 500, right, which is more appropriate for uh, these other social science experiments, it's actually going to be the case that the normal approximation is quite reasonable. After all, this is what you're going to use to test your hypotheses anyways. right? So why not use the same approximations to design slightly better experiments is actually the perspective that we're going to take. Uh, and as we're going to soon see, uh, while I use online platforms and these large sample sizes uh, to motivate the setup, our, our algorithms are actually going to be useful in, in a much broader sense. OK, so formally, here's the first uh, main result. Uh, our first formal result shows that if you think about these iterative Gaussian approximations, meaning if you condition on the past, right, g0 to t minus 1, the current GT follows this normal distribution that I just wrote down. Okay. Then what this theorem says is that the sequence of random variables, this stochastic process, is actually the right approximation to the joint distribution of the sample means that you see throughout the experiment. Capital T again is the number of times, number of days in the experiment, and each day you get to reallocate your measurement effort. Okay. So it's basically the TLT. Now, there's actually more to more than meets the eye in the sense that um, I kind of lied here. It's not just the CLT uh, in that if you think about GT, right, it follows uh, a distribution with pi t in it. And pi t itself is a random variable that depends on the past, right? Pi t is the proportion of times you decide to pull each arm, right, based on the Gaussian observations that you saw in the past. So if you want to show a result like this, uh, it turns out that you have to quite carefully control the modulus of continuity and the rate at which these uh, CLTs usually happen. So our result actually relies on, uh, in some sense, the right version of the multidimensional uh, science uh, lemma. And I'm happy to talk about going into the details uh, offline, but 
the main takeaway at the theorem box level is that our theorem actually doesn't require any assumptions on the magnitude of time. Okay, you just need it to be continuous. Now, at this point, uh, maybe a, a natural question to ask is, okay, fine, in the large batch limit, you have this uh, uh, validity of the approximation, but what if, uh, what happens for reasonable batch sizes, right? So Shane was asking 10 to the six, um, what happens if you only have 10 to the four or 100 even, right? So we have the same question and here's a uh, sort of an empirical validation plot, okay? Uh, on the x-axis, I'm plotting the simple regret, the terminal rewards that you gain under a particular policy. It actually doesn't matter that much what policy this is. And this is the histogram. Okay. Now, the green histogram is the histogram that you get under this idealized Gaussian limit. And then the blue and the pink histograms are what you actually see for finite batches, right? The real systems that you see. And we're going to look at a setting where uh, it's the, in some sense, the a very difficult regime, a worst case regime for our asymptotic uh, uh, machinery, where we have lots of reallocation opportunities, capital T is going to be equal to 10, and we're going to have a lot of arms, 100 arms. Okay. Here, you see that if the batch size is uh, 10,000, right, you can see that the blue histogram uh, can be reasonably approximated by the green histogram, how I expect it, okay. when you have a reasonable batch size. Now, if you look at the pink histogram, this is a case where 100 people use your product on any given day of the experiment, and you have 100 recommendation systems, 100 arms. So if you uniformly allocate 100 people to these 100 arms, you have one sample per arm. Right? So you'd be insane to use the normal approximation in this regime. But even then, you can kind of see that the pink, uh, pink uh, histogram actually uh, approximated by the green histogram, and it's not that bad. And this is something that we're going to verify over and over again, that the normal approximation is actually something that's quite reasonable to use, even for small batch sizes. And after all, this is why we teach it in Stats 101, right, to undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And in our paper, we also have a, a rigorous uh, bound on the convergence rate, the rate at which this V convergence happens. So if you think about some uh, distance notion that metrosize, metrosize uh, uh, the convergence, then uh, under no assumptions, you can show this type of a uh, uh, convergence rate. And if you assume that the policies, the allocations are uniformly lower bounded, this is often denoted the overlap assumption in causal inference or coverage in, in RL, then you get the standard uh, various seen uh, rate of one over square root of n. But in any case, right, the constants that you expect to see in the worst case are exponential in the horizon. Okay. Of course, the horizon is something like five again, and n is going to be fairly large. But the rate that's expected by our theoretical bounds is actually substantially slower than what we see in practice. Okay. So I, I don't think this, uh, this theorem is really the be the all end all, um, but it's rather mostly a, a sanity check that these convergences happen at, at a, a, a reasonable rate that you expect it to. Okay, so with this in mind, right, and, and this meaning normal approximations are actually a reasonable approximation to use, we're now going to concretely write down this dynamic program that I've been talking about. And the way we're gonna do this is to think about uh, maintaining posterior beliefs over the average rewards H. So H, well, again, was the thing that you wanted to infer Right, and uh, all of these online platforms they run thousands of A/B tests at each month. Okay, so it's actually quite plausible that you're gonna uh, have some prior over H. Could be a non and very non-informative prior, but let's just say that uh, you're gonna have some normal prior. Okay, now by uh, our CLT, we just saw that the Gaussian observations that you see on each day of the experiment, right, follows this normal distribution. Okay, so G given H is given by this normal approximation. I think this is the fourth time I'm staking the exact same normal distribution. Okay, so specify the prior and the likelihoods. Now, each day of the experiment, you're going to observe a bunch of sample means, right, for each of the treatment arms. And then you're going to use these Gs to update your posterior beliefs on which arms are good and which ones are not. Okay, 
And as I keep doing this, I'm going to try to pick pi, the allocation in each day of the experiment, to maximize your objective. Here, for simplicity, I'm just going to use terminal reward to illustrate our algorithms today. Okay. For those of you who are familiar with, say, things like the Gittins index, right? This philosophy uh, should be familiar. You maintain posterior beliefs, right? You keep on updating them as you see more evidence, right? And you view these as states of your MDP. Okay. So the states of our MDP are going to be the posterior mean and the posterior variances. And this is just, this is just the posterior updating formula that we usually teach in Staff 101 or 102. Right, uh, the details of here doesn't really matter, um, but basically the posterior variance is going to go down as you get more samples, right? And if you had allocated a lot of samples on any given day of the experiment, a big pi t, then your posterior variance is going to go down a lot. That's what the first equality says. The second equality, the second update says that you're going to update your posterior mean, right, based on this Gaussian observation. So it's kind of like a random walk. Now I've written down a very concrete MDP. Here's the dynamics again. Now if I have this MDP, the five horizon dynamic program, right? And my goal is to say, for example, optimize the terminal, re uh, terminal reward that I get at the end of the experiment. I can now write this in PyTorch, put on my ML app and go, how do I come up with approximate DP algorithms, right? I'm not gonna claim optimality anywhere in this talk, my goal is to just to, to just to do better than the status quo uh, static AD test, right? So how do I come up with such a reliable algorithm? That's the goal. I'm going to talk about how to design algorithms from this computational perspective today. Okay. Before I do that, let me just take stock of things, right? This formulation that we've just written down. You have this five horizon dynamic program. Our goal is to uh, optimize the reward of the arm that you choose at the end of the experiment, right? And then each day of the experiment, you collect these Gaussian observations, the sample means, use it to uh, update your posterior beliefs on the average rewards. And the key thing to, to have in mind here is that for those of you who are familiar with algorithms like Thompson sampling, right? Here, we're only requiring you to maintain a prior uh, belief over the average rewards, meaning, right? I only require you to model how people are going to behave on average throughout the entire platform, as opposed to how individuals behave, which is what Thompson sampling requires. Thompson sampling requires to have an individual prior and likelihood model on how Shane behaves, as opposed to how an entire uh, uh, set of people behave. So that's actually a key modeling advantage. And again, this optimization problem we just wrote down, it's really tailored to the instance specific signal to noise ratio, right? And the specific set of reallocation opportunities that you have at hand. And the key practical benefit here is that once you uh, solve this dynamic program, right? At each day of the experiment, you're just gonna uh, end up with a fixed probability distribution, right? So each time a user logs into your app, all you got to do is to sample an arm according to this fixed probability distribution, which is something that you can do very, very quickly. Now, contrast this again to standard methods like Thompson sampling. Thompson sampling requires you to do posterior inference real time. Sometimes that, that's going to require MCMC, right? So there's no way you can do that in two milliseconds. Okay, so again, the ease of deployability is actually a key practical advantage here. Any questions so far on this dynamic program that we just wrote down? So now let's talk about if we had solved the MDP in an approximate way, how are you actually going to use it? Okay. This is what in ML we call inference, actually using things, okay? So the dynamics of this MDP that we uh, uh, just wrote down, right? It used these idealized Gaussian variables. 
But of course, you never see these uh, idealized normal observations, right? What you see is the sample means. Okay, let me go over that again. So th this is the posterior update formula. So gauge, idealized Gaussian variables you never observe, right? You only see the sample means, okay, the scale sample means. So now in practice, what we're going to do is you're going to pretend like the scaled sample means are the normal observations. You're going to update your posterior beliefs using these, right? And you're going to calculate the fixed probability distribution according to the updated states. Okay. And again, this thing is very easy to deploy, as I just talked about. Now, in our paper, we have a sanity check that essentially says that in the large batch limit, right, this is closure. You don't have to use the normal idealized Gaussian. You can replace it with a sample mean, and the uh, uh, joint distribution of the dynamics are actually going to be the same as n forms. It's basic uh, check mark that you kind of, uh, kind of expect. All right. So now let's talk about uh, the most exciting part, which is how do we actually optimize this thing, right? How do we come up with a reasonable uh, adaptive allocation? So just to uh, uh, summarize the discussion so far, we just saw that by using these normal approximations, batching actually significantly simplifies algorithmic design despite the conventional wisdom. And unlike in the bandit literature, where uh, we either consider Gaussian uh, bandits versus Bernoulli bandits and so on, right? Gaussianity is a result. We're not assuming Gaussianity. We're saying that if you average across multiple people, multiple users, then you're going to get these normal likelihoods. And again, uh, a key modeling advantage is that you only need to maintain prior beliefs over the average rewards. And the final bullet is the most important thing on this slide, which is really that. I want to use differentiable programming, PyTorch, to come up with a modern uh, adaptive allocation method. Okay, I really want to bring to bear the full power of modern optimization tools. And by taking this mathematical programming approach, right, uh, we were essentially envisioning something like CVX, where you can write down as the product manager, for example, you can write down the set of desiderata for this experiment, and we want to come up with a way to approximate uh, solve them. So that's going to be what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next, uh, next 20 minutes of the talk. Okay. Um, so just to get you excited for what's to come, okay, here I have a summary plot where the dotted lines are prior art, meaning methods that existed before this paper. The green line is our method. And on the x-axis, we have the number of reallocation opportunities. So typically, you'd expect something like 5, right here at 10. On the y-axis, you have the percentage improvement over uh, the regret that you get under the static ADS. So lower is better here. Okay. And you can see that uh, even in a, a very underpowered setting where there's 100 arms, you see that we see a fairly large substantive improvements over prior art. So let's uh, now talk about how we got here. Okay. The way we got here is not by proving various theoretical results, but really just by experimenting in a careful way. We try to implement empirical rigor. There's different types of rigor. We often talk about theoretical rigor in our communities. Um, but empirical rigor is actually a, a key dimension that we need to explore more. And in this work, we actually try to be careful uh, ML empiricists. So let me just show you uh, a website that we made, or Ethan made, rather. And uh, I'm just unreasonably proud of this. Uh, so this is an interactive app. I actually suggest all of you to take a look at it, where we summarized uh, the the set of uh, benchmarking results that we did uh, in this setting. So we thought about a whole lot of different uh, uh, approximate DP methods, and then existing solutions that people uh, have used before our paper. 
And we, uh, we also thought about a bunch of different data generating distributions, different priors you can put on the model, right? And we essentially tried to sample the problem space, okay? So if you think about this, this two, uh, 3D space as the space of instances that you might be interested in, right? Uh, usually when you prove theoretical guarantees, you get to sample some connected region, right? Under, you know, five different assumptions you've got to put on to, to prove the result. Here, we're essentially doing a more sparse uh, sampling of this instance space, meaning we wrote down a set of realistic instances and we tested our, uh, all of our baselines and algorithms on all of these instances and picked out the algorithm that performs reliably across all of them. So you can actually explore how all of these algorithms do or, uh, in, in different scenarios, right? Uh, and, and you can really look at different settings here. So now in the remaining time, I'm gonna try to summarize these results uh, the best I can in, in a slide format. Okay? But I really suggest that you take a look at, uh, look at this interactive app. Okay, so the first algorithm that I'm gonna tell you about today is called Residual Horizon Optimization, ROW for short. It's an extremely simple method. It's, it's a type of an MVC algorithm, for those of you who know what that is. Um, it basically says that solving this dynamic program, it's of course challenging, right? It's a, a five horizon VP, but it involves continuous actions and continuous states. So now I'm gonna simplify this VP by saying at any given day of the experiment, I'm gonna consider future me's, right? Future experimenters that are not that smart. The future experimenters are only gonna base their uh, allocations on the information that you currently have access to. So that this way I can write down a very concrete optimization problem and I can solve it, okay? So you, could, can, you can treat this as a planning problem and on each day of the experiment, you solve this optimization problem, come up with the best allocation that you wanna use at this particular day, you apply this, right? And then you, uh, you observe a set of Gaussian observations. The next day you update your posteriors and you solve this problem again under these new states. And you just keep on doing this. And of course, because you're explicitly optimizing against all the future experimenters that are not that smart, right? You're guaranteed to outperform, out, outperform any allocation that only uses current information, duh, right? That's kind of obvious. Um, but in our paper, we also give a, a set of vanity checks for this very simple algorithm, which basically confirms that it does the right thing in simple scenarios where we know what the right thing to do is. So for example, if, if the signal to noise ratio is really, really low, then you need to know, use what's known as the Neyman allocation, meaning sample, sampling arms proportional to the measurement noise, because that, that, that's the dominating effect. Similarly, if you have many, many, many reallocation opportunities, we actually know that Thompson sampling or tough assumption sampling is actually the right approach. Okay, And we have uh, uh, various types of theoretical insights in the paper that show that Rho uh, actually kind of behave similar to Thompson sampling in, in certain curious ways. But perhaps more importantly, uh, in this talk, right, let me just give you some intuition on what this method does. So again, this is a resolving method for any, in any given day of the experiment, you try to project out into the future and solve one stochastic optimization problem, right? Take the solution out, apply it today, and then solve another one the next day, okay? So now I'm visualizing the designs, the decision variables that you get out of this optimization problem, where on the left panel, this is the uh, design that you get if the experiment was to end tomorrow. Okay, so you don't have a lot of time left here. So then this algorithm is telling me you should really focus your measurement effort on treatment arm two and three. But then on the right panel, you see that if the experiment was to end in 10 days, it's telling me to spread out my measurement effort. So you can see that this algorithm is really calibrating uh, the amount of exploration you want to do to the residual horizon that's left. Okay, that's why we call this residual horizon optimization. Any questions about this algorithm? Again, for those of you who know what MPC is, this is just an MPC policy. All right, now, in addition to this algorithm, of course, you can imagine a whole lot of different approximate DP methods that, uh, uh, that you can imagine implementing, and we actually did implement a bunch. I'm just gonna tell you about two today. Uh, the other approach is the good old policy gradients, okay? policy optimization. You parameterize your policy using, say, a neural net, and you try to directly optimize it using uh, SGD, basically. 
Now, the key uh, advantage that we have in this dynamic program compared to, say, regular RL is that the dynamics of this MDP is known and differentiable. Okay. So compared to typical policy gradient estimators that rely on the uh, score trick, right? you basically see a bunch of rewards and you try to use the, the score trick to reweight them to get your estimator. This actually has a really high variance, right? a common problem we see in policy gradients. Here, because the dynamics are all differentiable with respect to pi t's, as you can see in this uh, set of posterior update formulas, right? I can write down the entire MDP in PyTorch and audit it through the entire thing. So I can actually get pathwise gradients, right? Which in our community, we typically call this infinite symbol perturbation analysis. And we're essentially doing IPA using autodiffs using PyTorch. Okay. So we see that this actually makes optimization or training a lot more reliable. So once we get these uh, policy gradients, right, we just do stochastic gradient descent or ascent here, just around maximizing rewards. And we actually see that uh, these pathwise policy gradients, it's able to match the performance, right, or for sometimes perform slightly better than the previous simple approach, right, even when uh, the problem size is not that big. But we still do see some challenges in training this, uh, this thing uh, when the horizon is very large or uh, when we have a lot of arms. And this is due to the typical difficulty in training neural nets. Some set of engineering challenges that you'd expect. RL in general is, is quite hard, right? And here is a, a summary of our benchmarking plot, where again, y-axis is the percentage improvement over the static A-B test, lower is better, and x-axis the number of reallocation opportunities, the horizon of this DP. And you can see that uh, maybe the thing to focus on here is the orange line, the red line, and the green line. Okay, the red line is myopic, which pretends like the experiment always ends tomorrow. Okay, and as you can see, right, if you only have three horizons in the experiment, then it does pretty well. The orange line is this full-blown policy gradient method using this pathwise uh, derivative trick, and you can see that it does quite well. But this MPC method rho actually does remarkably well, and it's very, very reliable. On every single instance that we saw, we, we see that this actually performs close to the best. So this is actually the method that we ended up recommending in the paper, right? Not because it's optimal, it's not optimal in any way, but it's actually quite reliable, and we see this in all of our empirical benchmarking. Okay. Any questions on this empirical benchmarking effort? In some sense, this is the lead of the paper, where we did a whole lot of formulating and careful thinking to get to a point where we could actually use PyTorch and uh, empirical rigor, right, the level of empiricism that we expect in ML uh, to come up with a reasonable solution approach. Can I jump in again, please, Hong? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm very invested in your talk because I want to advance my professional network like you were describing earlier on. Yeah. Um so <laughs> so so I guess what I'm wondering is so the 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 row policy is um as you've said it's not optimal. Um but you're seeing that it's sort of consistently uh either op optimal amongst the ones you've tried or uh or close to um, so do you have any kind of, uh, dual bounds where, you know, what is actually possible? Good. Um, the short answer is no, because for small T things are very difficult. This is sort of the, uh, a slight variant of the settings that someone like Peter, uh, Fraser, uh, studied, you know, during the PhD, right? Uh, so... It's imagine even simple things like KG, it's very difficult to prove anything about. Uh, so, and for large horizon problems, you can think about different types of large deviation uh, rates, as, as Sandeep might saw at some point in the talk uh, uh, had worked on and so on. Uh, so there's various different theoretical analyses that you can imagine. Uh, but my current sense is that the theoretical tool sets that at least I have access to so far is too crude to tell apart the good ones, good algorithms from the bad ones. 
And it's actually somewhat puzzling to me right now as to why simple and PC policies are so robust and reliable. When I talk to, say, uh, friends in, in double E, right, who actually know uh, something about control and like myself, they're like, duh, of course it works well. So I, I feel like this is something that's kind of known uh, in the community and it's been known for a while. And we're essentially reaffirming this age, age old adage that MPC is something that's, that's quite reliable and often uh, outperforming more sophisticated approaches. Thank you. Um... I had one other question, and feel free to just say you'll talk about it later or whatever. Um, you, you showed us this result where you had 100 arms and 100 samples, and the Gaussian, this was a lot earlier, and the Gaussian uh, sort of curve was basically the same as what you saw with the, you know, with the, the sort of uh, another approach. Is this, it seems unreasonably good. So is, does that mean there's sort of some other thing going on, like an insensitivity property or... Mm -hmm. Something like that, like maybe good. plus one. Good, good, good. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I have the same question, in fact. Uh, I will talk a little bit about this uh, in three slides, but uh, not to your satisfaction. And I think it's a very uh, interesting topic uh, to maybe study further. Uh, okay, so to get to, to Shane's point, let me maybe show you one last set of uh, results, which is basically compa uh, comparing the output of our paper, right, the output of all of this empirical benchmarking with prior art, what uh, existed before this paper. So uh, the set of comparison points we look at is, of course, static A-B testing, and then a set of methods that people typically use right now. So one is called successive elimination. This is actually a very nice class of algorithms that effectively just remove arms, right, that are hopeless. And then we have the typical Thompson sampling policies. And again, Thompson sampling requires you to model each individual user's behavior, how Shane behaves, as opposed to the entire population. So this is what we call Oracle policies, but because they rely on the fact that you know the individual distributions. They're well specified. And uh, here's the, the it works plot that I showed you at the beginning, the height up plot, right? Here you have 100 arms and uh, a batch size of 10,000. And you can see that our uh, algorithm, the MPC algorithm, it performs substantially better than the algorithms that existed prior to this paper. Okay, so pretty big gap. Now to get to Shane's uh, question, what we're interested in is how do these results degrade as the validity of the normal approximation degrades, right? As the batch size becomes smaller. So now look at, let's look at the extreme version of this result, where again, going back to that histogram uh, example that I had, I have 100 arms here, and now I'm gonna have 100 people in each batch. So again, if you uniformly allocate 100 people to 100 arms, you have one person per arm. So you'd be, you'd be really insane to use the normal approximation here. And even then, we actually see that this algorithm does reasonably. We were pretty shocked by this. Uh, so the short answer to Shane's question before, uh, which was, why does this happen, right, is we don't know. But we do see this uh, quite a bit across uh, all the problem instances that we tested on. Now, um, when I talk to, say, folks in statistics about these types of results, they're also, again, unsurprised in the sense that I think it's been known for quite a while, right, since Gauss, basically, that Gaussian approximations are surprisingly reasonable, even when you have small sample sizes, something like 27, right, which is typically what the, the types of examples that we see in these stats uh, one-on-one -on -one textbooks. So in that sense, uh, I think the normal approximation is actually not that bad an approximation to begin with. And uh, my current sense is that these algorithms are going to be reasonable to use whenever you feel comfortable using p-values based on normal approximations. Okay. So if your rewards are very heavy held, you should not use any of this. You should also not use p-values based on normal approximations. So to the extent that you believe in your p-values, I think these designs are actually somewhat reasonable. But again, Shane, uh, I know this is not the, the right level of granularity uh, that you're expecting. And I, I think it's a mystery. It's an interesting mystery. Uh, I think expecting is, is too much. I, I, I'm not expecting anything. This is so impressive. But 
but it, may I just follow up with one thought, which is you're you're measuring everything by by regret. And so as long as you get orderings mostly right, you're in pretty good shape there, which I think is giving you a lot of insensitivity. Ah, good, 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 good. Um, so that's a good point. What we're testing actually is, so typically you actually have a, a lot of different outcomes you care about, right? You don't uh, care about a single outcome. And you also care about a bunch of constraints, meaning, uh, for example, let's say if you deploy a new recommendation system and it, for some reason, if it's draining the batteries out of, your, out of your phone, right? You really want to kill this experiment quickly. So you have these types of various guardrail metrics that you want to track and uh, have as a hard constraint on your experiment. So what I'm really imagining is this mathematical programming type of view where you have a bunch of different flexible objectives, right? And different set of constraints that you write down. And just like CVX, we use Gaussian approximations to write down a concrete formulation in PyTorch. And beneath it, there might be a bunch of different algorithms that we can use. Here we have one, and we've actually tested this against a whole range of different scenarios, not just this terminal regret scenario. It does seem to perform quite reliably. Uh, we don't claim to you know, have tested this on every single uh, objective combination one might imagine, but it does seem reasonable uh, in the sense that MPC is reasonable. But I, I, I do agree that uh, the reason we probably see such a large gap, for example, in this plot is, is probably because we are looking at terminal regret for a large set of arms. That, that is a good point. Um, good. So mostly just to, to as a summary, right, the key empirical takeaways here is that, again, Gaussian approximations, we're going to use it for statistical inference anyways, and it's actually quite useful for adaptive experiments as well, right, even when the batch size is somewhat small. And the policies that we derive by approximately solving our MVP, right, uh, it requires less modeling assumptions than uh, the standard bandit methods like constant sampling, which require complete knowledge of the individual rewards. And along all of these different approximate DP methods, right, I just showed you two today, policy gradient and then this MPC method, Rho. Right? Rho actually does really, really well. It's quite robust. And we see that these gains are particularly pronounced when you have a underpowered problem, right? When you have tons of arms or very high measurement noise, right? And this is really where the standard policies fail and where these computational approaches really shine. Uh, so with that, I'll think out of time, so I'll end here. Thanks for your attention. Happy to stick around if you have any more questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for a uh, fascinating talk, uh, Hong. So uh, before, uh, on, like while still everyone is here, uh, let me uh, just uh, say thank you again for uh, uh, for for joining the seminars during this season. And uh, also, so uh, again, let me also remind that uh, there will be uh, less special seminar next week, uh, not uh, two weeks from now. And uh okay, so going back to uh Hong's talk, uh do we have any other questions? So I have a question. Uh so in, in these experiments, uh <clears throat> so if uh if I understood correctly. If uh if the if the reward distribution itself is uh Gaussian like normally distributed, then uh your method is precise. So uh how far uh, how far are actual uh, reward distributions are from the Gaussian distribution in your ex uh experiments? Uh that's a great uh great question. So sometimes they are quite far. Um, and of course, even when things are Gaussian, none of our methods are optimal. I just want to start with that, right? Because uh, we're not solving the MVP uh, in an exact way. And mm. so these are all just approximate DP methods. Now, um, but so in this uh, interactive plot, you can see that, so the two uh, settings that we showcase here are the very typical Bernoulli uh, examples, right? But admittedly, these are, in some sense, uh, 
low variance examples because by nature you have zero or one for rewards. So to look at slightly more heavier tail scenarios, we did look at uh, the gamma gumbo uh, type of settings where you, you can modulate uh, the, the tail parameters in, in different ways. So we actually do expect that, uh, of course, as the validity of the normal approximation degrades, your p values are also going to be bad. And similarly, our normal approximations are also going to be bad. Mm -hmm. So the usual set of considerations right, that we usually have, should you be using, say, the stable LV limits instead, all, all kinds of different things will kick in here. Um, I do want to highlight one interesting regime, which is typically if you look at outcomes like clicks, right, then you're going to have a binary reward structure. And uh, it might be the case that you have very, very sparse rewards, meaning people don't buy your product very much or click on things very much. Right? In this case, the success probability for these Bernoullis are going to be very small. And this is another scenario where you don't expect these normal approximations to be all that good. Maybe then you should use a Poisson approximation. I believe uh, uh, Lin Fan, Win Jawa, and uh, Mike Harrison has a recent preprint uh, in the fully adapted regime that studies different types of uh, diffusion scalings that you can have in these types of results, like basically Poisson process approximations. I see, I see, great. So taking a step back, I think the main message that I would have here is you could think about different types of asymptotics and have them be approximations that you rely on and whatever parameterization in these uh, asymptotics that uh, you need to infer, right? You can put on posterior reliefs and update them and then write down a dynamic program. Uh, so I think that's actually a fairly general formula uh, and my guess is that you can go pretty far with it. And this is sort of mm. first step. I see. Okay. Uh, great, thanks. Um, any other question? All right. All right. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Yuan. See ya. Hey, Yuan.